It is a land of striking beauty. A picture postcard island, abundant in natural resources. The vast majority of Bougainvilleans, I would say over 97%, want the mine to be open. The ex-combatants, who uh, some, some of whom are still uh, holding on to guns, want the mine to be open. But as we will find out, not before they are compensated for the past. We leave by boat from the capital, Buka. Then it's a bone-rattling five-hour trip to the mine itself. A journey through battle sites and burnt-out remnants of a past that promised so much and delivered so little. The problem for the government here is, though they may be attempting to negotiate the reopening of the mine, the reality is they do not control the area around it. The mine is an effective no-go zone and former rebels operate a roadblock with the assistance of former members of the Bougainville Revolutionary Army. We're about to attempt to negotiate our way through. The rebel faction that mans the roadblock is called the Mekamui. They did not participate in the peace agreement that ended the war, and they remain both armed and dangerous. On agreement to pay an $80 fee on the way out, they allow us through, on condition that one of their men keeps his eye on us. It's not long before we pick up another passenger, and this time it is someone we had come looking for. Philip Miriori is a Panguna chief and landowner. He is friendly and suspicious. Who are you? Who are you, gentlemen? Uh, we're from SBS TV SBS. Australia. Spies for the Australia? No. <laughs> <laughs> the opposite. The opposite? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he is still yeah. scarred by the past. You see, um, <clears throat> what happened uh, during the crisis, it's something that, you know, it won't go out from uh, people's mind. We died for it, we shed blood for it, you know. Well, this is it, the Panguna mine, two kilometers wide, half a kilometer deep. The war that ensued here after the mine was closed down claimed the lives of some 15,000 Bougainvilleans, around one-tenth of the population. The Papua New Guinean government was desperate to reopen it because it provided it with around 20% of its revenues. The people of Bougainville got a little over 1% and a degraded environment, which is why they revolted. In 2001, in the aftermath of the war, many of the islanders launched a class action in the US against Bougainville Copper Limited's parent company, Rio Tinto. I was addressing jurisdiction I understand with regard that. to extraterritoriality. But there would be no need for the court to ever consider whether you had to exhaust in a foreign country if the... The case has been bogged down for 10 years. The landowners accuse Rio Tinto of genocide, citing the company's support of the blockade of the island and the military action which took place after the revolt against the mine began. The plaintiff's lawyers claiming that Rio Tinto's manager on Bougainville at the time encouraged continuation of the blockade for the purposes of starving the bastards out. Well, I've, I've certainly read that because it's, uh, it's one of the allegations and I know personally the top people that were managing the company at the time Peter Taylor is the chief executive of BCL. He told me he has personally investigated that claim and is convinced it is not true. I've asked them about this and none of them know anything about it, so I don't know where that came from. It just doesn't make sense because, you know, really the, uh, the Bougainville people were the people that we needed to work with and we wanted them on side, not off side. There was a big mountain there. 
And they, in order to get to the, the copper and the gold, they had to... They, they have to get rid of that. Panguna project. chief Philip Miriori is one of the bastards that Rio allegedly wanted to starve out. He is one of the named plaintiffs, one of the few still alive. Philip's story is told on page six of the claim. His father lost his life as a result of injuries he received in 1964 when an empty 44-gallon drum was allegedly hurled at him from an airborne helicopter operated by Rio. Rio Tinto, they found a war here, Rio Tinto. Uh, PNG government, you know, is only a small uh, a government, you know. But when you have the money, you see, you can do anything. It was on Rio's advice that devilish blockade also was in place. What hasn't been revealed until now is the powerful support the people of Bougainville had when they launched their class action. None other than Papua New Guinea's Prime Minister, Sir Michael Samari, providing the court with this sworn affidavit, alleging that it was Rio Tinto that was calling the shots during the Bougainville war, forcing the PNG government to launch the blockade of the island and the military action in order to reopen the mine. Obtained exclusively by Dateline, the affidavit written in 2001 when Sir Michael was in opposition states that... Because of Rio Tinto's financial influence in PNG, the company controlled the government. The government of PNG followed Rio Tinto's instructions and carried out its requests. BCL was also directly involved in the military operations on Bougainville and it played an active role. BCL supplied helicopters which were used as gunships, the pilots, troop transportation, fuel and troop barracks. Sir Michael goes on to say that without Rio Tinto's activity on Bougainville, the government would not have engaged in hostilities or taken military action on the island. Once more, Peter Taylor says the allegations are baseless. And I find it quite surprising he did say those things because he knows they're not true. Why would he swear on oath that, these, that, that, that this happened, considering he had intimate knowledge of the government at that time? Well, I don't know. I haven't asked him. And Jerry Singerock was the former head of the PNG Defence Force during the crisis. It was his decision to oppose the government's deployment of mercenaries from the Sandline Company that finally led to a negotiated settlement. Now a businessman in Port Moresby, he shares Sir Michael's interpretation of events. Well, I'm not surprised because, uh, because Rio Tinto and Bougainville Copper Limited were, 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 were big guns. I mean, they're, they're bigger players in, in, in Bougainville at the time. And money speaks, money's power. Uh, and they had so much influence over the decision-making process. The key clause that we have in the peace agreement is uh, the clause that talks about mining power and function. Sam Kauna was in the PNG Defence Force when the war broke out. He changed sides when he saw the plight of his people. He says the affidavit confirms what he knew all along. It didn't surprise me. All the time we, we knew about that. We knew that BCL was financing this war on Bougainville. It only confirms our suspicions because when we were fighting during those time around the mine, all the vehicle, BCL vehicle was being used by the security forces at that time. This is the kind of decisions that has affected uh, Papua New Guinea. And this is the kind of decision that's running Papua New Guinea down. PNG's new opposition leader, Belden Nama, spent five years in jail for defying the then government's decision to bring in the Sandline mercenaries. Prime Minister Sir Michael Samari pardoned him, but he is short on reciprocal forgiveness. It is really damaging for a father of a nation. Uh, he has carried this nation through to admit that, yes, Rio was supporting uh, the crisis on Bougainville. Uh, and uh, 
he has now deviated from his initial stance. Wrapped up in the legal claim is a demand for compensation for this. This was the river down which Panguna's copper tailings were deposited. It is more than 20 years since the slurry gates opened for the last time, but still there is no life in the river. Only children swim in its pools. And these are their wounds. Which their parents who pan for gold blame on the poisoned river. So every day time, when I may bagarap him, no, this la mining I bagarap him wara. Lol, when I may to inogat wara, so all get a time a little money by Sakam, was was loem, so all by got when I may be now all big, all big la man. We plan not like buy money open. So all big man, that's all I think also any big plan money only like buy money open because they only say he's in benefit law. So we plan yet all as as police lawyer, we plan not like stay red. Reconciliation is a government priority, and today villagers from across the island have gathered on the outskirts of the capital for a church fundraiser. I've been invited on stage by Bougainville's president, John Momus. He knows he is treading a fine line in his efforts to reopen the mine. He even wants the landowners to give up on their court case and allow the autonomous Bougainville government to attempt to cut a deal. I think it can be negotiated outside of court. In fact, I believe uh, if our people are prepared to um, allow the ABG to negotiate with, BC, with Rio Tinto, we would get a much better deal. But that is against everything that claimants like Philip Miriori have fought long and hard for. If they don't support the court case, no mining. Not just in Panguna, but anywhere in Bogan, because there will be no mining. We want to see the resolution of that court case, and ABG have to support that. At all costs, ABG have to support that. For the first time since the war, the Australian chief executive of Bougainville Copper Limited, Peter Taylor, visited the island last month. Oh. Peter Taylor danced here. Oh, really? In the moonlight. <laughs> The bamboo band, we have a beautiful bamboo bands here. Entertained by the president, he did not go to the mine itself, and with good reason. Oh yeah, I was very disappointed. When he steps on the soil and Buka, he claims Bougainville, but you have not met our customary requirements. You have not paid for the blood yet. Like I've said, blood is thicker than water. Former fighter Ishmael Turoama is not someone you would want to cross. What do you think the response would have been if he had come down here to the Panguna area? Oh, we, we probably would, we, we could get the blood and spit all over his face. That's it. Very simple. There is blood. You have not paid on the land that you are walking on. Many landowners believe President Momus is dancing to the PNG government's tune in his talks with the mine owners, but he candidly tells me he is battling with Port Moresby to get them to hand over their share of the royalties in any future deal. Though now that the war has been won and Bougainville has gained control of its resources, some ask why the PNG government is involved at all. In Bougainville, we have, we have won it. We have won it. We have bought it without blood. 20,000 people have shared their blood. In addition to that, there are laws of Bougainville, initially starting with Bougainville Peace Agreement, that gives powers and mining powers and function to Bougainville, not to Papua New Guinea.
But until its scheduled vote for independence in 2015, Bougainville remains part of PNG. And with Prime Minister Michael Somare's health failing, the man who could soon become the new leader has bad news for the mine owners. If we want to bury what has happened, it would be good to look at a new company coming in, I believe. You know, totally new company, totally open up a, 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 the entire negotiation again, with having in mind that the landowners must get the maximum out of their resource. We should be a country that should set an example to other countries that we have had a crisis. We have lost, lost so much people. We have to address it. What was the problem? The problem was that the government then did not address the land on a problem. So unless we learn from Bougainville, we're going to have more problems in this country. I would like to see Bougainville have the future that it really deserves. They have the will to make Bougainville the uh, premier province. I really believe they'll do it. They can only come back on our terms and conditions. This is our time. We have won the war and price is ours. And they have to come on that. They have to, uh, you know, they have to come on our terms and conditions.